Hello everyone, welcome to my messy studio and my channel. My name is Mark, and I'm an artist, an art professor, and a fountain pen addict. Much of the content on this channel revolves around using fountain pens for making art, with tons of reviews of different fountain pens and tutorials on different pen and ink techniques. But what is missing from my channel is a general introductory tutorial for those of you just starting out. I was there too, not so long ago, and the amount of information out there is simply staggering, much of it for those very strange people that seem to use their pens for writing. So this video is a primer specifically on using fountain pens for drawing. It'll briefly and hopefully concisely cover 11 topics, giving you enough information to get you started without being simplistic, and also provide additional resources where you can learn much, much more. Here are the 11 topics I'll be covering. Topic 1. For those of you still on the fountain pen fence, I'm going to be giving my incontrovertible reasons for why you should be drawing with a fountain pen. Topic 2. Fountain pen anatomy, wherein I cover the parts of the fountain pen and the often strange nomenclature used in the fountain pen community. And also discuss some of the things one should look for when searching for a pen. Topic 3 where we discuss the exciting world of filling systems, the pros and cons of each, and which ones I think are best for the artist. Topic four is all about nibs, what kind of nibs are particularly useful for the artist, and the differences between steel and gold nibs, and whether gold nibs are actually worth it. Topic five, I'm going to talk about vintage pens, what's so good about them, and whether they're worth getting. Topic six will be about the pocket pen, these are a super useful category that all artists should be aware of. Topic 7 is about basic pen maintenance and includes a discussion of cleaning and maintenance accessories, things you're going to need besides your fountain pen, including cleaning and maintenance supplies, filling supplies, and pen cases, etc. Topic 8. We're going to cover the many kinds of inks out there and their various interesting properties. Topic 9 will cover paper. What are the best papers to use for a fountain pen and how to choose a paper that will work best for your pen? Topic 10. What should you look for in a fountain pen and how much you should spend on it? By the way, I'm not going to be giving specific fountain pen recommendations in this video since many of my other videos already cover this information. And frankly, there are quite a few fountain pen recommendation videos out there already on other channels. My intention here is to give you the tools to make an informed decision about your pen purchases, rather than just outright tell you what to buy. But if that's what you're looking for, I'll leave some links to videos for you in the description section. In topic 11, I'm going to give you additional resources, where to learn more about fountain pens and where to go and buy them. So let's get started with topic 1, why use a fountain pen for drawing. For those of you that aren't convinced, here are my reasons for you to put down whatever you're currently drawing with and pick up a fountain pen. Reason 1. Line variation. The first, and to my mind, most important advantage of the fountain pen is that just about any one of them will allow you to make thick and thin lines by adding pressure. Some pens with flexible nibs are capable of tremendous line variation, allowing you to create super juicy and expressive lines. For artists that enjoy changing line weights in their drawings, such as myself, fountain pens are the way to go. And of course, if you're an artist that likes working with very consistent line weights, there are fountain pens out there for you too. Reason 2 is variety. Fountain pens come in a huge variety of sizes, shapes, and weights, come equipped with a huge variety of different nibs, have a huge variety of different filling systems, and are capable of using a huge variety of inks, and therefore provide a huge variety of drawing experiences. This means that with research, trial and error, and unfortunate but necessary lightening of the wallet, you can arrive at a pen that perfectly fits the way you work and make your art. Reason 3 is customizability. Besides the ability to choose a pen with the perfect attributes for your drawing style, many fountain pens can also be customized to work exactly how you want them. This ranges from simple adjustments that can be done in seconds, such as increasing or decreasing the flow of ink, or smoothing the nib, to more elaborate measures such as having a nibmeister grind the perfect nib for your drawing needs. Also, many pens allow you to switch out the nibs, letting you match that perfect nib with your favorite pen body. Reason 4 is inks. In recent decades, there have been an absolute explosion of inks available, not just in terms of colors, but also other interesting properties. Even those who prefer to use only black ink have a dizzying variety of blacks to choose from. Reason 5 is durability. While it's true that fountain pens are more expensive than other line making tools like microns or dip pens, they do not need replacing and can be used for decades and decades. In fact, I have vintage pens that I regularly use that are over 80 years old. 
In that respect, even a pen that costs several hundred dollars, which I know might seem like an insane price for a drawing implement, can be considered a good investment. Reason six is portability. This of course is an obvious one, but I think many people aren't aware of just how small fountain pens can be. This allows you to carry a fountain pen wherever you go and put together an ultra compact sketching kit that still retains the range of functionality and versatility that a fountain pen provides. Reason 7. And last, in case you thought this video would be entirely practical, fountain pens are beautiful and interesting to use. Pens are made from all kinds of colorful, neat looking materials, or can be transparent, allowing you to see all that gorgeous sloshing ink inside. I know we artists should focus on creating interesting and beautiful things rather than being fascinated by our tools, but there's something deeply satisfying about using a beautiful drawing instrument akin to the way violinists must feel when they take their violins out of their cases. And though it probably has no effect on the final outcome, picking up a gorgeous fountain pen inspires me to do my best work. Let's dissect these two fountain pens and talk about their basic parts. And as I do, we'll also talk about some things to think about when selecting a pen. This is a Pilot Custom 74, and this one is a demonstrator pen made by Narwhal. The tip of the cap is often referred to as the finial. Then we have the clip, of course, and then on some pans, you have one or more rings, which are called center bands. These are sometimes purely decorative, but can provide reinforcement to the cap, adding to its durability. On the inside of the cap, which you can see on this clear pen, is usually an inner cap, sometimes called the insert, which serves to better seal the nib from the outside air and keep it from drying out. On this pen we also have one. Let's see if we can show it to you. Yeah, you can see it on the inside here. This is a very good feature to have, but most pens will have them, so it's not something you really need to watch out for. Some caps will fit on the back of the pen, something called posting. Some pens post well, such as this Pilot Custom 74, making the pen not too long and back heavy, and some pens post very poorly, such as this Narwhal, where the cap posts very shallowly, making the pen very long and back heavy. And then there are plenty of pens that don't post at all. I do like a pen that posts well, since it eliminates the problem of keeping the cap around when working outside the studio, but it's far from a deal breaker, so long as the rest of the pen has very good qualities. Here is the nib, a very important part of the pen to be sure, but behind it is an equally important part, called the feed, which provides ink to the nib. In some pens, the nib and feeds are friction fit and pull right out as they do in this pilot. Let's give it a shot. And in other pens, such as this Narwhal demonstrator, the nib and feed are installed in what's called a housing unit, which needs to be unscrewed like this. Housing units don't really confer any advantages and there are excellent pens in both configurations. Friction fit pens, however, are easier to clean since there's less stuff to take apart. The feed is, again, the second most important part of the pen and plays a large part in the way a pen writes. A generous feed will make a pen write very wet and a miserly feed will make a pen write dry. And in many cases, if a nib feels scratchy or inconsistent, the problem actually lies not with the nib, but with the feed providing inadequate ink. Most feeds are made of plastic, while some, particularly in older pens, are made of a hard vulcanized rubber called ebonite. The consensus seems to be that ebonite feeds do a better job providing ink flow, but I suspect the design of the feed is more important than the material it's made from. Whatever the case, plastic feeds usually do a fine enough job. Let's take this nib off and take a look at the feed. In the center of the feed, you have this little thin slit, which is called the ink channel. And this, by the way, can be enlarged to increase the flow if your pen writes too dry. A tutorial on that is coming soon. And then on the bottom of the feed, you have the fins. Though quite a few pens don't have them, they are there to control dripping and are often very fragile. And you have to be careful not to bend them when pulling the nib and feed out of a housing unit. Damage to them, however, is an aesthetic problem and will not alter the performance of your pen. This part here is called the grip section. 
Group sections come in a large variety of shapes, widths, lengths, and textures, and you'll eventually arrive at your own preferences based on such factors as your hand size and how you hold your pen. And while these preferences are highly individualized and subjective, there are a few universal fatal flaws to watch out for in the grip section that'll make a pen very uncomfortable. The first and most significant is a grip section that is too slick. This occurs mainly on sections made from polished metal. The slipperiness of the grip will make the pen feel unstable in your hand, especially as it gets sweaty or oily, causing you to grip tighter, which over time leads to hand strain. A perfect example of this is this Duke 209, which otherwise is a fantastic pen, but for the slicked, polished metal grip. My advice is, if you're looking to buy a metal pen, look for some kind of textured finish on the grip section, such as this excellent Muji pen, which has knurling on the grip. The second fault in the grip section is sharp threading, which will dig into your fingers, leading to discomfort, such as in this Kaweco Supra. Look for cap threading that is either away from the grip section or is rounded and not too prominent. The third fatal flaw is a big step up from the grip section to the pen body. So this jump from the grip to the pen body right here. I can't speak for all artists, but I calmly shift my grip up and down when I draw and will eventually sometimes grip the pen on the body itself. A big step up from the section to the body can get annoying over time, preventing me from quickly shifting my grip. On cartridge converter pens, the grip section unscrews from the pen body, like this, giving you access either to the ink cartridge or the converter. In some pens with built-in filling system, the grip section can also be unscrewed from the body. Not in this one, but in, let's see, this pen right here. All right, you can see the grip section unscrews. This feature is not a deal breaker if missing, but makes cleaning the pen body thoroughly much easier and is a nice thing to have. And lastly, we have the barrel. Since, again, there's a tendency to move the fingers up and down the pen when drawing, having a barrel that is similar in girth to the section is helpful. When a pen has a built-in filling mechanism, like this one, I find that a pen with a clear material, called a demonstrator, is very useful since it allows you to see what kind of ink you have inside and how much is left. In a cartridge converter, this isn't quite as useful since most inks will coat the cartridge or the converter, preventing you from actually gauging how much ink you have inside. When it comes to choosing that perfect pen body, the range of options can be overwhelming, but keep in mind that if you're an artist, you're probably accustomed to working with a very large variety of drawing and painting implements, and that there really isn't an ideal dimension and weight for a pen. I have pens that are super short and heavy, and I have pens that are large and light. And guess what? I love both, and chances are you'll also develop seemingly contradictory preferences to very different pens. Now let's talk about some of the more common filling systems out there. The most common probably is the Humble Cartridge Converter. These pens, as the name implies, use either a cartridge or a converter, such as this one, to deliver ink to the nib. The advantages of cartridges is mainly the use and maintenance. You pop the cartridge into a pen, wait a little bit for the ink to work its way towards the nib, and you're good to go. Switching inks is also a cinch since there's nothing to clean other than the nib and the feed. The best thing about cartridge converters is that there are no moving parts in the pen other than of course the converter which can be easily replaced, making such pens very durable over the long term. Because these pens also use converters, it allows you to fill the pen using bottled inks, which is great because it vastly increases the array of ink you can use. And while cleaning the actual converters is a little more time consuming than replacing a cartridge, it's significantly easier than having to clean a pen with a built-in filling mechanism. What's the disadvantage of a cartridge converter? It's mainly the ink capacity. Artists go through a lot of ink, and though carrying extra ink cartridges around isn't much of a hassle, it's one more thing you have to remember in your sketching kit. Furthermore, it's sometimes hard to tell exactly how much ink you have left, particularly with the darker inks. Many ink cartridges conform to a single international standard size, so you have quite a lot of options available in terms of ink cartridges. However, this isn't the case for every brand, with quite a few brands, including Pilot, using proprietary cartridges. This, I would say, is a slight drawback, since proprietary cartridges are usually more expensive and have a smaller variety of ink options. The way to overcome this limitation is to refill empty cartridges with bottled ink using a syringe. 
Many pens nowadays have a built-in filling mechanism, the most common being the piston filler that uses a knob at the back of the pen to move a piston, sucking ink into the barrel. The main advantage of piston fillers is that they hold way more ink than either cartridges or converters, something that is very valuable to artists who work outside of the studio for long periods of time. I love the fact that I can fill up my pens every few weeks and go forth from my studio with confidence that my pens will not run out of ink, no matter how heavily I use them. Furthermore, as I mentioned, bottled ink comes in so many more colors and varieties than ink and cartridges. As for disadvantages, well, piston fillers are harder to clean, especially if the grip section doesn't unscrew from the barrel. If it does, you can give the pen a good flush, but if it doesn't, you have two options. The first is to repeatedly fill and empty the pen with water, a tedious process, or a much more drastic measure, unscrewing the piston knob, usually with a wrench that comes with the pen, to pull out the entire piston mechanism. This I don't recommend you do often, since it puts stress on the pen, and reassembly can be tricky. The other disadvantage is that since you're filling the pen from a bottle, the ink level has to be high enough so that the nib and a bit of the grip section is completely submerged. That makes it difficult and eventually impossible to fill your pen when the ink levels get low in a bottle. Also, since you're dipping your pen in ink, you have to wipe the pen down after filling, and that process always involves getting ink all over your fingers. The last disadvantage is that piston fillers have moving parts which will wear out over time. The first thing to go is usually the silicone or rubber piston, which can be replaced of course, provided that the company is still in business and still making the part for the pen. The second most common filling mechanism is actually not all that common, a distant second to the piston filler, and that is the vacuum filler. This mechanism uses a plunger that when pushed down the barrel creates a vacuum. So you can unscrew the piston knob here, and then as the plunger pushes down, it creates a vacuum in the back of the pen, and then here the gauge inside the barrel widens, releasing the vacuum, pulling ink into the barrel. It's a very neat system, and for some reason a very satisfying way to fill a pen. The vacuum filling mechanism has a few advantages over the piston filler. The plunger takes up far less space in the barrel, giving vacuum fillers massive ink capacity, often twice as much as a piston filling pen. Another advantage is the vacuum fillers actually have two ink chambers, the main one here, and then a little ink chamber inside here, near the grip section. When the piston knob is fully closed, it closes off the main reservoir from the smaller one. This might seem like a weird feature, but it actually serves to make the pen completely leak-proof. Normally, you have to empty your pen when taking it on an airplane because the change of pressure on the flight will make ink spurt out of the pen. That's not the case with vacuum fillers, since the reservoir can be completely sealed off. Vacuum fillers are usually easier to clean than piston fillers, because the plunger creates greater pressure than the piston can when pushing and pulling water through the nib and the feed. And if you want to clean the pen thoroughly, vacuum fillers are also easier to disassemble and put together. As for disadvantages, the first is that getting a full fill with a vacuum filler can be tricky. As with piston fillers, filling becomes impossible when ink levels are low in a bottle, and the filling process will inevitably get ink all over your fingers. Also, as with piston fillers, we have the issue of moving parts which will need to be maintained and which over time will wear and need to be replaced. The third most common way to fill a pen is to use an eyedropper. Eyedropper filled pens have neither cartridges or converters or a built-in filling system of any kind inside the barrel. Instead, the entire barrel of the pen is filled using an eyedropper. Some pens, such as this one, are designed to be eyedroppered, but really any pen with a solid plastic barrel with no contact with metal parts can be converted into an eyedropper with a bit of silicone grease and an o-ring. Pens filled with an eyedropper have some enormous advantages to the artist. The biggest one is obvious, massive ink capacity, even with a tiny eyedropper such as this one having many times the ink capacity of an average cartridge converter. Since you fill the pen with an eyedropper, this is the cleanest way of filling a pen, and allows you to use the very last drop of ink in your bottle. It also makes it easier to make custom ink mixes, since you can even mix or dilute your inks directly inside the barrel. Cleaning eyedropper filled pens is super easy, usually requiring nothing but a simple flush, so this is a great filling system for those that switch inks often. As for maintenance and longevity, this is a system with no moving parts to maintain, so these kinds of pens will last you indefinitely. Eyedropper filled pens do have their disadvantages, and the main one is burping. 
This occurs when the air inside the pen heats up due to your hand, forcing the ink out of the nib. This can be prevented by keeping the pen always full, limiting the amount of air inside, but that sort of defeats the point of having an eyedropper, which is massive ink capacity. There is a rare type of eyedropper which has a double reservoir system, much like the vacuum fillers that I showed you, which allow you to seal off the main reservoir from the smaller reservoir using this piston knob. This not only prevents the burping problem that plagues eyedropper filled pens, it also allows you to carry the pen safely on flights. The problem is, this system is only available on Opus 88 pens, the Moonman C4, and some older Japanese vintage models. So, what is my favorite filling system? Which one would I recommend for artists? I really like the eyedropper fillers with a double reservoir system, but again, they're not very common, only available on a few pen models. While plain eyedroppers do have their advantages, the burping issue can be very annoying, and I generally don't use them when I'm doing work where I can't afford to have drops in my drawing. Vacuum fillers are awesome, but also don't come on that many pens. For those who don't care about incapacity, cartridge converters are really the way to go. But personally, I don't like having to carry extra cartridges around and worry that I'll run out of ink during a heavy drawing session. That leaves us with the piston filler, which, despite its drawbacks, is my recommendation for artists. It's widely available on a large number of pens at many different price points, so you're not going to be limited in your pen choices. When I was first getting into fountain pens, I was immediately wowed by the cool filling systems, and if you have any nerdiness in you at all, you will be too. My advice is not to obsess over filling mechanisms, because ultimately, they don't play a large part in how much you're going to reach for a pen. Some of my favorite pens are cartridge converters, even though the cartridge converter system is my least favorite way of filling a pen. Conversely, while vacuum filling systems are close to being my favorite, there are plenty of vacuum fillers that I think are pure garbage. Only a small percentage of time is spent filling a pen, so the most important thing isn't the pen body or the filling system, it's the part that actually makes contact with the paper, the nib, which is what we're going to discuss right now. Fountain pen nibs come in a variety of sizes, starting with extra fine, then fine, medium, and broad, and occasionally double broad. Sadly, there is no industry standard for these sizes, so they're going to vary in size from brand to brand. Japanese nibs, such as the ones on Pilot, Platinum, and Sailor, tend to run finer than Western nibs, so if you're looking for a pen with a very fine line, a Japanese extra fine is about as fine as you're able to get out of the box. If you'd like to go even finer, then you can get the Pen Custom Ground, a service that'll generally run you about $50. A nibmeister can ground your pen down as fine as you want, all the way down to something called needlepoint, which is extra, 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 extra fine. Additionally, some online retailers also have in-house grinding services and can sell you a custom ground nib, cutting down on wait time. As I mentioned, one of the main advantages of using a fountain pen is the variety of nibs out there. So let's talk about the many types of nibs you can find on the market and why they're useful for you, the artist. These kinds of nibs have flexible tines that spread with pressure increasing line width, which makes them very useful artists that want to employ line variation in their drawing. The degree of flexibility will range greatly, going from what is called a soft nib with slight line variation to super flexible nibs favored by calligraphers. While there are some very good options at lower price points, this is a category where spending more pays off, since some of the best performing pens are well over $100. This is also the only category where I think it's worthwhile exploring vintage options, which often cost less and perform better. This is a big topic, however, that I cover extensively in other videos, so if you're interested in these kinds of nibs, I will leave links to those videos in the description. Stub nibs are similar to italic nibs, being wide and flat. The difference being is that stubs have rounded shoulders, making them easier to control and more suitable for drawing. The two most commonly available sizes are the 1.2 and the 2mm stub. These types of nibs are fun to draw with, giving you a similar result to working with a reed pen, and if you've never tried one and enjoy the drawings of Van Gogh, I recommend you pick one up. These types of nibs are bent, allowing you to control line width when you hold your pen at different angles. So if the pen is held at a more vertical angle, you'll get a finer line, becoming thicker and thicker as you lower the angle. These are some of my favorite nibs to draw with, giving you massive line variation and the ability to create all kinds of interesting textures and strokes. I have quite a few videos on this kind of nib on my channel, and if you'd like to learn more, I'll leave some links for you below. 
Zoom nibs are similar to the Fude in that the tip of the nib is curved, allowing you to control line width based on angle. They come in many different shapes and sizes and are usually super juicy and fun to do loose, messy drawings with. While many fountain pens use proprietary nibs on their pens that can't be swapped, there are quite a few manufacturers that use standard nibs that are interchangeable with other nibs of the same size. Most of these standard sized nibs are either number 5 or number 6, which means that if you have a pen that uses either one of those sizes and would like to try another nib, you can easily buy one and swap it out instead of having to buy a whole other pen. Though I have quite a few pens with proprietary nibs that can't be swapped, I find that pens that take either a number 5 or number 6 standard nib to be very useful, allowing me to use them with a huge variety of different nibs. Just keep in mind that this compatibility extends only to the nibs, not the feed housing units which are not compatible between brands. Fountain pen nibs are usually made of either stainless steel or gold alloy. Is there a difference in performance between the two materials? Some people say that because gold is a softer material, the gold nibs feel bouncier than steel. But this, I believe, is more the product of the shape of the nib rather than the material it's made from. And there are plenty of bouncy steel nibs. Some people also say that gold nibs are smoother than steel, but again, that depends on the way a nib is finished and not on the material, and there are plenty of pens with gold nibs that are scratchier than pens with steel nibs. My conclusion, and I know I'm going to ruffle some feathers here, is that with one significant exception, which we'll get to, there is no difference between steel and gold. So what is the exception? The exception is that most high quality flexible nibs are made of gold. Why that is, is more a question of tradition rather than metallurgy, because gold is not inherently a more springy material than steel. Whatever the reason, the fact remains that the flexiest, springiest, and best performing nibs are made of gold, with the very, very best being nibs that were made before 1950. Why before 1950? Because around that time, most pen manufacturers stopped producing flexible nibs, and the technology behind making them was lost. So, while modern manufacturers and some skilled nibmeisters have come close to reproducing the performance of Vintage Flex, most fountain pen experts consider Gold Vintage Flex superior. So, while we're on the topic of vintage nibs, let's talk about them and if they're worth getting. During the period between 1900 and 1950, the fountain pen was the predominant writing instrument, and everyone had one. Hundreds of pen manufacturers focused all of their efforts on making fountain pens to feed the tremendous demand, and as a result, there are still tons of vintage pens around, many of which outperform their modern counterparts, particularly when it comes to flexible nibs. And while some are highly sought after by collectors, there are still plenty of bargains out there that can be had for under $100, especially if you don't care if the pen is in mint condition. Vintage pens are too varied to be quantified in one fell swoop, but they tend to be very smooth and wet and super fun to draw with. Vintage flex pens are even better, snappy, flexible, and with generous feeds that are perfectly designed to provide enough ink to the nib. Drawing with vintage pens is a pleasure that definitely needs to be experienced. Unfortunately, they come with significant drawbacks, the most important of which is the issue of fragility. Very old pens were made of ebonite, which is a brittle material prone to shattering when dropped. Other vintage materials such as celluloid and other early plastics are prone to shrinkage and cracking. Most vintage pens need to be treated with care and aren't well suited for outdoor sketching kits or the rough and tumble environment of the studio. Another important drawback is that most vintage pens are not designed to be taken apart and are therefore very difficult to clean and maintain. Given these drawbacks, I generally advise artists not to invest in vintage pens for everyday use. That said, there is a category of vintage pens that I do recommend for drawing. German vintage pens from the 1950s and 60s, with brands such as Pelican, Osmia, and Mont Blanc, among others. These are wonderfully sturdy piston felling pens that are robust enough to withstand everyday use. But so long as you understand that vintage pens are to be used lightly and carefully, then it's a wonderful area to explore, filled with a dazzling variety of options to choose from. Everything from American eyedropper pens from the 1890s to Japanese cartridge converters from the 1970s. One category of pens all artists should be aware of is the pocket pen. These kinds of pens are very short, but when capped, become normal sized when posted.
They come in a range of sizes from teeny tiny, like this Kaweco Lily Put, to something closer to full size, like this Twisby Mini, and also can be found with every possible filling system and nib type. Despite their small size, they function exactly the same way as the larger counterparts, something they can't be said of other miniature art materials, such as miniature palettes, tiny travel brushes, and other compact materials. This makes them ideal for compact sketching kits or just to put in your pocket. I'm a tireless advocate of the practice of carrying a sketchbook and sketching materials absolutely everywhere, and pocket pens allow you to make sure you have a fountain pen on you at all times. Fountain pens require maintenance in order to work well over time, but the most important thing you can do is to clean them. How often and how thoroughly depends on the pen, the kind of ink you use, and how often you use the pen, but it's recommended that pens be flushed with water every two months, and more frequently, let's say every three weeks, if using waterproof inks. I recommend pulling the nib and feet out of the pen and letting them soak and scrubbing them gently with an old toothbrush to remove any built up residue. You can do a more thorough cleaning with a liquid called pen flush, which is mostly water with a little bit of ammonia and detergent, but only if the pen starts exhibiting poor ink flow. You can buy pre-made pen flush, but there are plenty of effective recipes online if you look for them. Pens should be disassembled only in rare circumstances, when ink has dried in the barrel for example, since the process puts stress on the pen and reassembly, especially for piston fillers, is tricky. Other than regular flushing with water, the best thing you can do is just to use the pen regularly and don't let it sit inked for long periods of time. I'm guilty of having tons of pens inked up at the same time, but if you're not going to use a pen in the near future, clean it and put it away so that the next time you use it, it'll start right up. By the way, the best way to store your pen is horizontally. Storing the pen nib side up will dry up your pen, and putting the pen nib side down might cause ink to drip into your cap. Now let's talk maintenance accessories that you should definitely get to get the best performance out of your pen. This is a bulb syringe and it's indispensable if your pen has a removable section. These things are great for quick regular flushing with water and will be in most cases all you need to do even if switching ink colors. For more thorough cleaning you'll still have to pull out the nib and feed however. Pen flush. This is rarely needed, but does an excellent job if your pen dries out or starts experiencing significant writing problems. You can buy it online from a number of retailers or just mix up your own using commonly found household cleaning items. This is a jeweler's loop. This powerful magnifying glass will allow you to see your nib up close and diagnose and fix misaligned tines. This is a fairly common problem with pens out of the box and will occasionally happen to a pen when you use it. Misaligned tines will result in the pen skipping or being scratchy in one direction. Fixing such a problem is very simple, a question of gently pushing one of the tines up or down until it aligns with the other, but this is a very difficult thing to do without one of these loops. A wide rubber band or a piece of bicycle inner tube. In some housing units, the nib and feet are very tightly fitted and having a rubber grip is very useful for pulling them out without doing damage to the delicate fins of the feet. This is a strip of acetate. A small strip like this, such as a piece of camera film, is invaluable for cleaning out paper fibers from your nib or digging out residue from the ink channel of your feed. This is particularly useful for artists working on soft watercolor paper where loose paper fibers are an issue or if you're working with pigmented inks that have a tendency to clog the ink channel of your feed. High quality paper towels. Get yourself some very absorbent, heavy-duty paper towels, such as this blue shop towel sold in hardware stores, to clean the grip section of your pen after filling, and to shake out any excess ink. Silicone grease. This stuff is indispensable for pens with self-filling mechanisms and eyedroppers. It's used to re-grease the pistons on piston fillers and plungers on vac fillers, as well as to grease up the barrel threads on eyedroppers. Quite a few Chinese self-filling pens come with little vials of the stuff, so you might not need to buy it separately. Here are a few little things I recommend for filling your pens. For pens with built-in filling mechanisms, not having enough ink in a bottle is an annoying issue, which is why I enjoy having this. It's very helpful, allowing you to use almost every last drop of ink from your bottle. A better and more expensive product is this one. This ingenious traveling inkwell made by Peniter. Not only does it allow you to safely carry up to 10 cc's of ink, 
but it allows you to stick a pen into it of just about any size, flip it over, and get a complete fill. And the great thing about it is that the cap contains a similar filling cup as this one, so you can fill the pen using either method. This is also a fantastic option for vacuum filled pens because it allows you to get the fullest fill possible all in one shot. This syringe without a sharp tip, sold at most fountain pen retailers, is super useful for a number of reasons. If you plan on buying an eyedropper pen, a syringe gives you more control over filling than an eyedropper, making it easier to avoid getting ink on the barrel threads. Also, if you plan to refill ink cartridges, this tool is indispensable. It's also very good for mixing and diluting inks. And of course, no pen is complete without something to carry it in, along with the rest of your sketching kit. When I'm out sketching, I usually carry one of two kits, this one and this one. Both are made by Lihid Lab. This one is the compact, and this one is the double model. For a full discussion of everything in my sketching kits, please see my two videos on them that I'll link to below. This first statement might be obvious to some, but you don't know how many students I've had bring in clogged fountain pens wondering what they did wrong, only to realize that the drawing ink they used in their dip pens is not suitable for fountain pens. Never put regular drawing ink in your pens, even if it's water soluble. The pigments in those inks are not ground finely enough to pass through the ink channels on a fountain pen, and while with enough scrubbing and soaking you can get a pen working again, that assumes you're lucky enough to have a pen that can be fully disassembled, because if it cannot, you're probably out of luck. Fortunately for us, inks designed specifically for fountain pens come in a dizzying variety of colors, but also quite a few interesting properties, so there's no shortage of options. Here is a quick breakdown of them. Shading inks have a high degree of transparency, and therefore a high degree of value variation depending on the concentration of ink. Some of these inks, because they're composed of multiple pigments of slightly different densities, will vary in color depending on how much ink is put down. I find these to be some of my favorite kinds of ink since they allow you to be more gradual when building up the darker values and also to introduce a degree of color complexity even when using a single ink. Please see my video on shading inks if you'd like more information. Sheening ink is a type of ink that dries in an irregular way with areas where the ink is more concentrated forming shiny areas that appear as different colors under certain light angles. This is a very neat effect that creates a lot of beautiful, interesting color variation. The only limitation here is that this effect only works with very wet writing pens with broad enough strokes. I have yet to fully exploit this type of ink, but can see its potential for artists that enjoy working with vivid, expressive color. Shimmering ink is a type of ink that contains a very fine reflective pigment, giving the appearance of metallic sparkle. Like sheening, these types of inks work best in wet pens with broad nibs. While this is not an ink property I've used in my own work, I think for artists that are into enjoying all kinds of interesting technical effects, this might be a very interesting property to explore. The only caveat is that these kinds of inks have a tendency to clog up the pens, so you have to use them in pens that fully disassemble and are easy to clean. If you're planning to combine lined with watercolor wash, then you need to use waterproof fountain pen ink. For black inks, you have a few options. Noodler's Black, Platinum Carbon Black, Diatrementis Document Black, as well as the black made by Roher and Klingner. All four work very well, but require different degrees of drying time depending on the paper, the wetness of the pen, and atmospheric conditions. If you're looking for waterproof ink in other colors, then Diatrementis Document Inks and Roher and Klinger Sketch Inks are the brands to look for. The selection of color isn't great for either brand, but large enough that you'll be able to find a color that you like or mix up a color to your preference. By the way, Diatrementis also sells their document inks in universal cartridges. All waterproof inks have a tendency to clog your pens over time, so again, make sure you flush out your pens frequently, let's say every three weeks, even the ones getting regular use. If the pen is clogged, you're going to have to do a deep cleaning with a flush to get things flowing again. One disadvantage with fountain pens is that they usually have a hard time on crappy paper. Fountain pen ink is much more fluid than the standard shellac based drawing inks you might be used to working with, and will therefore have a greater tendency to feather or strike through regular drawing paper. 
How much feathering will depend on the kind of ink, the wetness of the pen, and of course the paper. And while I've had good success working with fountain pens in my regular sketchbooks filled with general purpose drawing paper, you'll be better served by working on a multimedia sketchbook designed for pen or aqueous media. One of my favorite sketchbooks is the Talens Art Creation Sketchbook, and it's filled with a thin, relatively smooth paper that resists feathering and striking through, even with very heavy applications of ink, and it also takes washes very well. For longer, more finished work, particularly when I want to combine ink and wash, I prefer to work on hot press watercolor paper. Arches, this one is a great brand, but many other 100% cotton rag watercolor papers also work well. For example, this watercolor paper sketchbook made by Hanemule. My main piece of advice is that artist papers aren't designed for fountain pen ink in mind. So even if a paper is sold as being suitable for pen and ink, it might behave in a less than ideal way. Especially when it comes to projects you care about, do some testing to make sure that your materials behave exactly as you want them to. When looking for a fountain pen, the priority should be to find one with a perfectly consistent nib, one that doesn't skip in any direction or any speed. That is the most important thing, everything else is absolutely secondary. As a rule, entry-level steel nibs of the Japanese brands Pilot, Platinum, and Sailor are super consistent, as are the steel nibs made by the three major German manufacturers of nibs, Yovo, Bach, and Schmidt. These nibs are available on a number of international brands such as Twisby, Kaweco, Opus 88, and many others. Chinese pen brands such as Jinhao, Moonman, Asphine, and Pen BBS are making tremendous headway in terms of quality of their pen bodies, but as a whole, their nibs are not quite there yet. Fortunately, many of them use a standard number 5 or number 6 size, so if you're unsatisfied with the nib performance, you can swap the nib out for a better one. As far as how much to spend on a pen, here is my advice. Avoid pens under $10. Most of these pens come with inconsistent nibs and questionable build quality. I think the $30 to $60 range is the way to go. In this range, you start finding pens with decent build quality and high quality steel German nibs, again made by Bach, Yovo, or Schmidt. And this happens to be the most exciting price range right now, with new pens being released all the time, so you'll never run out of interesting options. While I think the excellent filling system and build quality of Opus 88 pens is worth the $100 to $120 price tag, this is the absolutely upper limit I would spend on a pen. If you're buying a pen solely on the basis of how well it works. There are obviously quite a few pens beyond this price range, and there's nothing wrong with paying more for a superbly crafted pen with a gold nib, so long as you recognize that you're paying a premium for a beautiful luxury item and not for better pen performance. The only exception would be pens with flexible nibs. I have quite a few videos on my channel where I talk about inexpensive and well-performing flex nibs, but the very best performing flexible nibs are made of gold and will cost well over $100, though you can occasionally find a vintage pen that is cheaper. Steven Inks is a channel that features fountain pen reviews also from an artist's perspective. Steven, though I'm not sure that's his real name, is a skilled imaginative cartoonist with a quirky sense of humor and some strong, funny, and insightful opinions on fountain pens. Definitely useful watching, especially if you're looking for pens at that lower price point. Jonathan Weinberg is a prominent artist and pen reviewer whose thoughtful, detailed reviews of fountain pens have put an unfortunate strain on my wallet. He reviews a very broad range of pens, from the very expensive, to vintage, to budget, all from the perspective of an artist. Goulet Pens, Goldspot, and Jet Pens are three online retailers with terrific YouTube content covering tons and tons of information. Their sites also have in-depth resources. I hope you found this introductory video useful. Such videos are difficult to make since there's so much information out there and it's hard to know what to include. If you have any recommendations on how to improve this video, don't hesitate to let me know or suggest subjects for future videos. Your comments are always welcome. Thanks so much for watching and see you next time.